Okay, so it's my pleasure to welcome Evan Chang from the uh, University of Colorado. So Evan is an assistant professor, the tenure track assistant professor at the University of Colorado. Um, and he uh, obtained his PhD from the uh, University of California, Berkeley, uh, under the supervision of George Mikula. So over the years, Evan has done a lot of interesting work uh, in the area of static program analysis, dynamic program analysis. So today, he will tell us a little bit about it. Thank you very much, Martin, and thank you very much for the invitation from Peter and Ryan. Thank you for sticking around for the uh, last talk of the workshop, so I'll try to do my best to send it off right, okay? So, unfortunately, Angry Birds has stopped. Of course, this is a crash in an Android application. So, and in today's uh, world, unfortunately, a crash is really quite magnified by the crowd, right? If we scroll down here uh, and uh, highlight maybe something that, uh, that, you know, there are people that are reporting that your app crashes and is sluggish and maybe even cause them to think that your app is spyware. So, of course, they force the poor software developers to ask for help. And where do they ask? Well, they ask the expert developers. So I you know, searched and found a, a nice talk from an expert developer on how Square approaches Android crashes. And here's the summary of the talk. Well, one, first, you just have to face it. It's inevitable. It's gonna, your app is going to crash. And it's not, necess not necessarily your fault. So what should you do? Well, log as much information as you possibly can as you're developing an app so that when it happens, uh, you have some information of what to do. Uh, check conditions to crash early and fast so that you're more likely to see it in, in, in testing. Okay, so that's the expert advice. So unfortunately, well, you're still the poor app developer for advice, so even really suppose that we, we follow this advice and we're lucky and get a crash. Uh, now what? Uh, so where in the code, in which callback does the, a field get set to null that eventually causes the crash? Why did the callback happen before the one that, caused the, that, that you see that crashed? You know, maybe is there another callback that should have reset the field to be non-null, right? So something as, as basic as, as null pointer dereferences means that, well, you're still crying for help. I don't know how that field became null. Right? And often, actually, it's a misunderstanding of how the that the framework interacts with your app. So it's not entirely your fault as an app developer, even though it's traced back to the app. And really, sometimes it's not even your fault. Maybe you perfectly understand how it works on Samsung phones, but, but not on LG phones, because maybe the framework is slightly different. So the bug is from violating some implicit framework rules that, that you just should know about as an app developer that are not necessarily codified. So let's go back here to uh, you know, the crowd. And you see down there that what's new is that it's bug fixes. So actually, probably most apps, they say what's new is bug fixes. So maybe there's an opportunity here as well. Okay. Oh. Apps, uh, well, okay, animation seems to be fancy. Okay, sorry. So, so we also are thinking about imagining uh, some world in this, in this situation that, well, I don't know how that field became null. And in particular, I'm not alone as an Android developer, as we just saw. And that maybe someone else also has encountered the same issue and for whatever reason has gone through their log messages and the sweat. Maybe their boss said, you have to fix this bug, otherwise, you know, that's it. Um, and so that person has figured out a bug fix. Maybe it gets committed to uh, a public source code repository and maybe we can then leverage that, right? So then we have a project looking at, well, how do we do this transfer? How do we transfer a bug fix using total analysis and synthesis. So the task in this talk that I want to lay out is we're going to look at kind of these two halves. One is how do we actually think about proving and triaging safety properties in event-driven applications, assuming we know something about how the protocol should work. Okay. And then we're going to, uh, then I want to, you know, preview a little bit of some newer work, uh, uh, some unpublished stuff. Um, where we're trying to mine artifacts for these protocol specifications, the subsequent um, bug fixes. Okay. So the first piece of this work is this hopper. I'm looking at goal-directed program analysis. Uh, we're jumping. Then I'll talk about another project uh, on, on mining and understanding bug fixes. All right. So let's dive in. 
talk about Hopper. All right, so again, this is uh, the, motiva the motivation, is that we have this crash. And just as a rough, uh, another point of, you know, maybe how important it is, we looked at our corpus of applications that we tested on, and we just quickly searched for how many time commit messages say no pointer exception. And I was actually quite surprised that 3% of the commit messages say uh, something about no pointer exceptions. Um, and we all know that how great, you know, developers write informative, detailed commit messages, right? So I, I expect this to be an undercount. All right. So let's say a little bit about how this works in Android. So Android is a callback-oriented system. Uh, so that is, as um, uh, uh, an app, uh, when you develop an app, you're not just developing an isolated app, but you're developing in the context of a big Android framework. And how you interact with the app is you implement a whole bunch of callbacks okay. uh, that, that you register with the framework to call you to inform you about something that happens, or some event that happens. And uh, these are arranged in components. The main component in Android is what's called an activity. Uh, and so you implement a whole bunch of methods uh, on an activity component. And there are some sort of ordering constraints that are placed upon the invocation of these methods. So Android components have some sort of order lifecycle that, you know, first it gets created, so you get informed about on creation. Uh, there's various other things in the active part of the, the activity component, and then eventually you get notified when, you're, when your component is destroyed. And in particular, uh, since Android is a relatively resource-constrained device, you might actually do things like uh, nulling out uh, things for your service or your, your database, um, uh, because you need to collect resources when you're done uh, to try to maximize the use of your resources. Right? But life cycles of different components and other callbacks can interleave, and, uh, and this is the sort of issue that, that, that we get into. So. so there's a need as an Android developer to eagerly release resources, but safety, many safety property, but as an example of dereferences, depends on the particular interleaving of callbacks. So, and then, well, these callbacks, how do they interact and talk to each other? Well, they interact through a shared heap. Uh, so operate over a shared global heap, and then, therefore, the safety of these dereferences depends on the order of heap rights that then depends on the interleaving of these callbacks. So, you know, so if we're thinking about implementing some sort of program analysis, well, then what do we want to do? We want to explore the possible callback interleaves. And so here's my one component. Maybe I have another component in my system. Um, and so there's no surprise to people in this room, so I don't have to belabor this point, but well, if I'm considering all possible things, I, well, maybe I say on create in the first component, and then I consider the effects of on resume in the first component and on create in the second component. Well, I have to consider the other option. It's no surprise that, um, that this becomes intractable, and it's also no surprise that previous analyses do not consider really intercomponent interleavings in any sort of flow-sensitive way. Right? Uh, and just as a little bit of preview, right? Um, uh, so we looked at one application that has 1,320 callbacks. And if we were to just sort of create the product automaton, then we would end up with 10 to 111 nodes, even with some sort of unsound assumption that you ever, only ever create one instance of a particular. But if we come back to the problem that, at hand that we're trying to deal with, it really shouldn't be so hard. Okay, let me try to sketch that. Right, so let's say that we have a particular dereference in the onClick method, so uh, of mhostDB. And what we're trying to do is see if that particular dereference is safe. So the idea, of, the basic idea is that, well, the safety of this particular dereference should not require a reason about all callback interleavings, but somehow just ones that are relevant to this particular dereference. So a smart, uh, we'll say, goal-directed analysis could consider the relevant callback orderings without considering all of them if all I care about is proving this one particular dereference safe. So what do I mean by goal-directed uh, program analysis? Well, it says if I care about this particular dereference, uh, 
the basic idea is given a particular program configuration goal, we want to try to derive a contradiction with respect to its reachability. That is, for this particular dereference, I want to know about the error, the possible error condition, that m host db is, is null. And if I sort of work backwards from, you know, uh, uh, on the program and I derive, you know, false uh, along all paths, then I've sort of essentially proven that this is safe. I've derived contradiction with respect to its reachability, right? And we'd had some prior work on, on this idea where we took such things, um, and because we're working over a shared, shared heap, we consider a sort of separation logic um, uh, abstract domain to think about this. So this prior work on, on Thresher was a backwards abstract interpretation with separation logic constraints to refute such similar error conditions. And I say abstract interpretation because I'm just trying to emphasize the fact that what we're doing here is over approximate. The analysis is over approximate, which is, you know, so typical backwards analyses are, are, are often under approximate. We're trying to actually, you know, be over approximate and, and get proofs. Okay, so let's get back to the original problem and how do we be smart? Okay, so let me use an example to illustrate that. So I have two dereferences. That's one is safe and one is buggy. Right. I have these two questions right. uh, in my on-click callback about uh, either dereferencing m host db or dereferencing m service. And I show again that on destroy method where I end up nulling these two uh, these two fields um, to collect the the appropriate resources. So of course, what that means is that well, the constraints about the Android lifecycle are relevant to us, we can't just ignore, um, um, right? And then I have this other method that's relevant, and then maybe let's make this bit more interactive, so which one is safe and which one is Okay, yes? Perfect, okay, I'm, I'm talking to the right crowd here, okay? Right, so one is safe because, okay, this m host tv field is initialized in the onCreate method, okay? Um, and that comes before, like, onClick can't happen until onCreate has happened. Great, all right, so that's good. And the other one, you know, by the axiom of, you know, one safe, one is buggy, uh, the other one has to be buggy, all right? And that's because, well, it's possible that the user can actually click and cause uh, the dereference, um, before the uh, the service is connected, before the unconnected service. And now that if we've seen this code, I think we can all empathize with the plight of Android developers, right? It's okay, so we need to consider some, but not all callback ordering constraints that create happens before click, before before destroy. But really, the the basic challenge here is like if I have 1,300 callbacks in, in my app, uh, how do I identify these three and no more, or these four and no more than that? So the basic idea is actually quite straightforward when I put it in, in these terms of, you know, what do we do to distill down to a slide, right? Is that if I have a whole bunch of components in my system and I'm thinking about trying to prove the safety of some property in on-click, okay, a dereference as an example, I can think about finding the, the possible call, callbacks that are relevant uh, from, from, uh, from a data perspective. What can possibly affect this property that I'm trying to prove in on click? And so I can sort of ignore the control flow at that point. And maybe I highlight that, oh yes, these are the, the four methods that are relevant, okay? Or the three, relevant, three methods that are relevant to on click, okay? And then I can drop everything else. And then once I've considered those, I can also consider an extra filtering, which is now I can consider the, con the possible control flow in the particular component, and that allows me to throw away the, the on destroy as something next I have to consider. Right, and so then the analysis can essentially go to those two uh, methods and continue the analysis, and in some ways you, it seems like the analysis just jumps to those other two callbacks, and so this is where our term jumping comes from, right? So that's what's implemented in our tool called Hopper. So the contribution, you know, is that, um, is that idea of jumping, right? So we have a framework for sound jumping analysis because now it seems like, well, we just jump to random parts of the code. How do we know that that's okay? 
And then we have applied this idea to, to the, the problem of, of Android life cycles. So let me say a few words about this framework and how that might be useful to consider other contexts. Okay. So uh, the basic idea is to interleave this notion of data relevance and control feasibility. So if we think about the sort of guts of a, a program analysis, you know, at some point you're, you're looking at a current program location, L, and a current query about something you're gonna ask about your program. Okay. And then what you will do next is, the first thing you'll say is like, well, tell me what are the next possible uh, transitions that could be made. So you consult your transition relation and say, well, what are the next transitions of the program? Or if you're going backwards, what are the previous transitions of the program? And then you would apply you know, appropriate uh, transfer functions on, on, on your query. So the typical thing is, well, we just ask the transition relation for the next transitions, and we follow the normal control flow of the program. But in some sense, I have the current query here that I highlight and why it's on the slide is we're just ignoring that bit of information when we ask about what are the next possible transitions. So the main idea is, is actually that straightforward, right? Is that, well, we also can consult what is the current uh, query that we're trying to, trying to prove or, or refute. And so we replace the transition relation, which we'll call the a relevance relation that we can consider, can, can, can consider generically, right? That follows some other transitions based upon this query queue. So we can actually leverage the information in query queue. And separates into those two pieces. That is, you can have a component that identifies with maybe some separate program analysis, program locations that can affect that query queue. And then you can consider uh, uh, filtering those locations that can feasibly reach this current uh, location that you care about without going through any other, other transitions that you were trying to do. So this is a little bit abstract, so let me start to make this a bit more concrete. So maybe based on data relevance, you identify a whole bunch of locations in your program that could affect the, the current query queue. And this is, could be computed using any many different things. We consider we use a pre-pass points analysis to consider this, but you know you could consider something coarser with types or fields or something. And this is really a classic idea. So this first step is a classic idea. By instead of following control flow, but following data dependencies, you get a sparse analysis. Okay. But here, if we just stopped here, then it would be a flow insensitive analysis, and that wouldn't be sufficient for what we care about. So then the next step is then, well, given that set, you could say, well, let me filter, filter this down, and what kind of filtering are we considering? Is this, if I'm at the current program location L, I can filter a set of data relevant locations that I might have to continue to using any other control flow that I might have. Okay. So if I know that um, 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 L4 uh, comes after L, then it's not backward reachable from the, the current program location. I could throw it out and I don't have to consider it uh, in my next step. Right. And then also more, also very important is that, well, I can also throw out L1 because L2 and L3 must be visited before uh, getting to L1. And that's basically it. So, um, one thing that we do discuss, um, and I'll just kind of say it, state it, is that, well, you can just make various different choices um, uh, for this control feasibility component, and you'll yield the sort of classical notions, variants of flow path and context sensitivity and, and And it's this data relevance uh, part that makes the analysis sparse. So we're able to be sparse, sparse and, and efficient by using data relevance with whatever desired control flow abstraction that you care about. And then you can be selective, because I'm sort of talking about one analysis step. Right? You can be selective about how you apply uh, control flow information by varying the relevance relation at each analysis step. Right? So the typical analysis would just sort of fix you know, one way of exploring the program globally throughout. Here you could say, well, let me compute using one, uh, one, one, one relation this step. Next step, based on the query, I decide to do something else. Okay. 
So that's a matter of policy now. So soundness uh, in, in, in the paper that we prove is that, well, if you, you know, say that data relevance and control feasibility are sound in you know, some reasonable way, then no behavior relevant to refuting the query queue can be found. That is, doing this jumping is, is indeed sound. Right? So in the, in the summary, right, the contribution is, well, Hopper's analysis that jumps. Um, and how do we apply that to, to Android life cycles? Right, so basically that just amounts to instantiating that relevance relation with a particular policy for analyzing Android. And you can consider an instantiating the framework for some other problem. Right. So within an event callback, what we do is we just follow the predecessor transitions because, well, it turns out it's still feasible to be as precise as possible within callbacks. So you should think about an Android program not as one big program in your usual sort of Java program sense from main, but like a forest of tiny, lots of tiny little programs. Um, and so within one of these tiny programs, just be as precise as possible. Okay? But between event callbacks, we use, that's where we use the jumping, using these lifecycle graphs about components to do this control feasibility filtering. Right? So avoiding that costly and unnecessary interleaving depending upon the query of interest. OK, so is jumping effective for inter-event analysis? So the experiment that we run is actually this dereference client. So we're trying the, the experiment is to prove all dereferences safe in a particular Android environment. Now, of course, this is doing all is just for the purposes of evaluation. But a use case could be that the user says, this dereference, I'm not sure why it's crashing. You know, I just want to know about this one. That is one benefit. We consider 10 open source apps, you know, ranging from 3,000 to 57,000 lines with you know, 10 to 100 components, and as I said, up to 1,300 callbacks. And the event product graph, I guess I've said before, is that, well, it gets big, right? Um, I don't have to belabor that point for this audience. Okay. So at his previous analyses, do not comp consider intercomponent interleavings because of this huge explosion. So we compared three analyses, one that's uh, uh, type-based and in, in, in a sort of local, um, local analysis as, as the baseline. Um, an analysis where we consider goal-directed analysis that's path-sensitive as precise as possible uh, using the, our previous Thresher tool, uh, but it doesn't know anything about jumping. So and then Hopper, which does this jumping. So here are our benchmarks, um, you know, applications that maybe you've used. Or um, and then those are the total number of dereferences. And the only point here is that, well, we have a huge number of things that we're trying to prove, 62,000 dereferences we're trying to look at. And then how I'm going to show the results is I'm going to consider the unproven, what's left over after each of these tools. So after the sort of local type-based analysis of MIT, um, not our tool, uh, um, then you know you have something like 40,000 uh, uh, unproven dereferences. And if you, then you apply some path sensitive reason within events, so intra-event, you can actually get that down quite significantly. Uh, so using no jumping to uh, about 10,000 dereferences left. Uh, but there, if you're sort of like with an alarm, you're trying to triage, it's still quite painful because you're, you know, you're still saying, like, what are the callback interleavings? You're still asking yourself that question. Um, so you could still imagine that those 10,000 take quite a long time. Um, with jumping, that cuts about in half to, to, to about 5,000 dereferences left. So I, you know, I will be completely, you know, of course, that's still a big number. Right? But maybe also, it's a slightly easier question you're asking if you're trying to triage those alarms, because it's going to give you, like, here is a possible interleaving that I think could cause a crash. And so now you're asking a sort of recognition problem, uh, are the given callback interleavings feasible? So to summarize whether this is effective, right? so the overall improvement um, is about 54% from Hopper to Thresher. But the bottom line thing is that we're able to prove about over about 92% of the dereferences safe in all these dereferences, okay. um, which I think is kind of a good result. You know, in, in particular, there are some applications where you could imagine 
it's still being feasible to actually go in manually and do the, the remainder. Okay? It actually gets to the realm of feasibility. Right? And as a comparison point, I think, if we sort of look in the literature as far as state-of-the-art no-pointer um, exception checking work, also report some number that's in that similar range, you know, from you know, uh, 80s, high 80s to low 90s uh, percentage proven in normal Java programs. And uh, I made some argument that it's potentially harder uh, in Android, given sort of the necessity to, to collect resources as quickly as possible. Right. Um, and then there's the analysis time, which, you know, it's also significant, if you will, but, you know, running time of a day or so, uh, which factors to about a second per dereference, but worthwhile compared to the sort of overall triaging problem. So, the bottom line is, well, Hopper proves 92% of the dereference is safe uh, uh, with interleaving of callbacks from an arbitrary number of components. So we make no assumptions about the fixed number of components that you may instantiate. Okay, so of course we wanna know what's left. So we, we couldn't look at all 5,000, but we triage 200 alarms that are left. So uh, 189 of them were false. So, you know, there's, there's things to do. And most of the reasons are, you know, I think because of insufficient Android modeling or uh, maybe other concerns like container and string uh, domains that we didn't consider in our implementation. But of those, only 17 of the false alarms were actually due to timeouts, which really was the sort of co core thing that we were looking at here. So at, at least there's some, some, some niceties there. If, which is always fun here. We found 11 bugs in four apps, in, in real apps. And, and uh, five of those bugs were actually really due to bad ordering assumptions. And what's fun about the world these days is you can actually you know, go in and submit patches. Um, and uh, 10 of those 11 patches were accepted. So. Now, of course, in any audience, they're like, what about that one, right? <laughs> OK. Yes, so one was not accepted in uh, what seems like a seemingly inactive project. So not sure whether it's good or bad, just that maybe the project has been abandoned. So Now maybe if we caught that bug sooner, then the project would still be alive, right? I, I don't know. <laughs> right, so I said this already, Hopper's analysis that jumps, and the two, the, the basic ideas, right, is this sort of selective control flow abstraction with a sound relevance relation, right? And then using, in particular, the Android context, the inter-event ordering reasoning we get by considering life cycle control feasibility. So, all right, so that's the first half of the talk about how we do proofs, okay? All right, uh, any questions at this point about this? Yeah? So I have a question on, like, what it looks to me even in the example, if you say it's correct, but it looks like these are basically essentially missing what, it's not like you get no points at the reference because Nobody ever wrote to this variable ever before. Like somebody is writing to it, yeah. but whoever is writing to it, that event is not ordered to it, whoever is dereferencing. That's, and that's right. So it looks like those bugs are basically data races. Those are races, yes. Yeah. That particular bug. This, the, all, the, all the ones you get missing ordering constraints, this basically means data race. Can um, go back to the slide? Yes, yes sure. sure. Uh, of the example? This one, this one. Bad ordering assumptions essentially mean... Yeah. Oh, the bad, uh, of the bad ordering assumptions. Yeah. These, are, oh, these are all data races. I think all these bugs. Data races which cause no point of the reference. Well, they matter, you could sort of potentially detect them as data races. Right. Okay. I, I would expect most of them you could potentially detect as data races, although we didn't. Be good to hear. Like this relevance is very interesting. It's like what happens in the predicate abstraction with the relevant predicates. So it's just a very central concept. Central concept of somehow distilling out and throwing out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you mind you give this relevance or you can keep it? From yeah. So so in this work, it's manual in the sense that there's an encoding of the life cycle constraint there for control feasibility. For data relevance, it's based upon, well, data, so based upon a points to analysis. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah, 
have extra questions. Okay. So let me say a little bit about this other project, which you know I'll say it's connected here. Okay. Because there we sort of made the assumption that we we have some specification about you know the the ordering. Okay. So this is a broader project looking at mining and understanding bug fixes for protocols. And this was really motivated by what I said we get about, uh, you know, a little bit earlier about, well, as an Android developer, I, you know, I'm not alone. So this is a, a big project um, um, where we're looking at, um, um, uh, from, from this diagram, some sort of interaction between using symbolic program analysis techniques, so like from a very, very high level that allows us to sort of transition between sort of syntactic artifacts to semantic artifacts, uh, semantic artifacts to something that's statistical and semantic to derive some sort of repair specifications, and then use those repair specifications uh, in, in the context of synthesis to generate patches to be able to transfer a bug fix into something that's relevant for my context. Um, coupled with some user-centered uh, analytics to essentially drive and identify particular commits that might be potentially interesting. All coupled with um, the need for um, 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 software engineering. Uh, okay, so this is a multi-faculty project where we're collect collaboratively investigating you know, uh, uh, these ideas. Uh, transferring bug fixes by mining code commits. I won't be able to talk about all the projects there, otherwise we'd be here all day or something, right? Um, so I have to focus on one thing. So I'll focus on one thing I'm most uh, involved in, which has some connection to the, to the first part of the talk. Okay. And in particular, uh, I kind of, you know, uh, there's a hidden truth in the first part of the talk. So if you will, I lied a little bit here <laughs> in the first part of the talk. Um, uh, that, that really callback ordering constraints are, are not static, right? It looks like, you know, it's just, just this, right? This graph, right? Or this automata. So let's look really what, what is going on in an Android system in, in more depth, right? And I kind of view it as a dialogue between the framework and between the application where, you know, when the, some event happens, like the user clicks a button, then, well, the framework invokes a, a callback on the application, okay, like the on-click callback, right? So a callback is where the framework invokes an application method. And then likewise, in processing that callback, the application may actually is issue a callback to the, uh, the framework, right? And we actually give a terminology here just for the sake of discussion, right? That a call-in is where an application invokes a framework method as a sort of dual of a callback. All right, so maybe that after processing that, uh, the, the, the callback returns. And um, so this on-click callback returns uh, to the framework. And then the next event is that, well, in that previous callback, we launched a background task called an async task okay, with an execute call. And then that task finishes. Right? And then once that task finishes, you as the application get a notification get a callback of this on post execute callback. And in particular, this on post execute callback cannot happen unless you've done the execute, uh, unless execute has been called. Right? So the event-driven framework here in Android right, uses callbacks to notify uh, you, of, uh, you, the application, of events. But you, as the application, use call-ins to affect how the framework invokes future callbacks. Right, and that's that's the hidden truth that I, you know, was not so upfront with earlier. And in particular, now you can start to think about issues, right, like races, where like, well, what if this background task takes a little bit longer to, to finish? Okay. Then, well, maybe the user comes in and clicks again, uh, and where that invokes the on-click callback onto you, and then you issue the async task execute, and it turns out, well, this is an exception, right? You're not allowed to call execute on the same async task and some just part of the 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 protocol, right? Like one async task corresponds to one execution task, right? And you can just start it once and that's it. And what might be the fix for this? Well, here's probably the most elegant fix is that when you uh, um, when the user clicks and you launch this background task, that you actually disable the button, 
so that the user can't click it anymore. Okay? So yet you have another interaction where it says like, well, the click is not always possible, only if the button is enabled. Is that Right, so there's a need here, right, that we have to model and reason about how call-ins affect callbacks and vice versa, and it's, you know, it's a mess. Okay? So the, the, uh, the, you know, the contributions of this work is that, well, we distilled this down into some sort of core concrete model of event-driven systems, capturing how call-ins and callbacks affect each other. And then from that, we developed a specification language to model the effects of Android call-ins and callbacks, to be able to try to describe those, uh, an abstraction. And then uh, we've taken that to then uh, look at mining these life state specifications. So we call these rules in our specification life state rules, um, sort of life cycle and type state together, and verifying the absence of these life state races. So just to give a sense, uh, I'll be very brief on, on these bits, right, about uh, what this model looks like. Well, it really comes from this picture, right, is that as a, uh, there's some sort of hidden state here, that is the framework has some set of callbacks that are enabled and it's okay for the framework to, to invoke, like the activity on click here at this point. And then when a particular uh, method gets called, like the callback for activity on click, then there's also a set of, of call-ins that are allowed for the application to call, okay? Like async text to execute and button disable. And when the application makes some invocation, like for async ta task execute, then there also, uh, there's some change in the enabled things, right? So now async task on post execute could be possible. It is enabled, right? We don't know if it's gonna happen, well, but it's now enabled. And that can also affect saying that, well, now it's no longer allowed. You can no longer, you're no longer allowed to call async task.execute. And so forth, like with the button disabling and so forth. Right? So the model state that we need to capture is that enabled callbacks track what the framework may invoke next, and allowed call-ins track what the application can invoke without it. So these are the, 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 the aspects we care about. So then life state rules specify essentially this core idea of enabledness and allowedness and their effects. That is, we may have a rule like uh, an enable rule that says some sort of callback, or the way they view about this is a message, is the terminology here, uh, is that it's some sort of a suspended callback or call-in invocation, but as a thunk, that when this message is invoked, that causes a callback to be added to the enabled step. And then, you know, uh, sort of symmetrically, you could have a disabling rule. So when this message one gets invoked, then a callback is removed from the set. And then symmetrically for call-ins, um, that something gets added to the allowed set and some message gets disallowed. So it's kind of straightforward, right? That we specify that when message one is invoked, the effect on the enabled allowed state, the sort of hidden state of the framework that's not really explicitly in Android or anything, is to enable, disable, allow, or disallow message two. So, great, now we just go ahead and specify stuff about Android, right? Well, these specifications don't often don't exist in the documentation, so this is a snippet of the documentation from an async task, and it doesn't say anything about execute. Um, and the Android framework is humongous. So hundreds of API packages, thousands of API classes, tens of thousands of API methods. So, well, writing specifications by hand would be pretty hard and error prone and uh, probably object to that, right? So, um, so the task here that we're embarking on is to try to mine these life state specifications of the Android framework from a large corpus of actual apps, okay? Interacting with the framework based upon this Lambda life model. Okay, so the setup here is that we're gonna learn life state rules by you know, getting a bunch of traces okay. from our co huge corpus of Android apps. And then we'll slice those traces to be things that are somehow relevant to particular Android components. Right? And then we apply some, some um, machine learning techniques, some unsupervised learning techniques to try to learn these specifications. And they sort of, the ones that we've tried correspond to, um, well, one are sort of automata 
uh, learning models, like hidden Markov models and pro probabilistic finite state machines. And then somehow we have to abstract those, those automata models into these life state rules. We've also had another approach, which is to look something more direct about directly learning those rules by using a model counting approach by, by uh, delegating to uh, So we actually try a portfolio approaches to learn these candidate specifications because we really don't expect one to sort of beat them all or, or, or so forth. Um, so very high level results about this. Uh, I could say more detailed stuff, but um, 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 I'll leave that for questions, I guess. Is that do we actually learn some rules that correspond to actual Android behavior? Well, we looked at four Android framework classes just to narrow the, the study, which if we look at the, the number of methods there, there's you know, over 7,000 possible you know, combinations uh, of specification rules that you might have. And we actually found 82 rules corresponding to Android behavior by sort of taking, looking at the sort of top 150 or so rules um, uh, for each framework class, or total, okay. And in fact, uh, most of them are really, you know, let's say in the top 175 or something like that. So we actually found actual rules in, uh, we think, a rather under-constrained search space and discovered some undocumented rules. So here's one such example. Right. That is, a Delva can get a crash by misusing fragment.get resources and then maybe goes to the Android developer doc documentation and gets this. So. I, I see smirks for people who know that this is just auto-generated, so this is essentially the null documentation, right? And after, after we got this, then of course I just went to Stack Overflow and Googled, you know, fragment get resources, and indeed there are such posts about, you know. Okay, so to conclude here, right? Talked about two pieces. Uh, Hopper, which proves safety properties in event-driven programs by jumping, by soundly jumping between callbacks. And then uh, this uh, sub-project uh, here on Droid Life about mining life state models of how call-ins and callbacks affect each other in Android. Uh, with that, I will take your questions and I will show you a beautiful scene of Boulder so that I invite you all to come visit and by the scenery, and you know, here's the you know our programming languages and verification group. Lots of talk to to do the scientific part, maybe on the hike or something. Oh, I mean, it's, you know, 
Um, there's no specific thing that you can get from the, the framework that says what is enabled. It's a sort of modeling artifact that we're trying to uh, present, or it's an abstraction of some internals of the framework. So you can implement a code that essentially puts something that Yeah, but this, you know, there's lots of different cues, and I guess you know this very well, right? There's lots of different cues and native stuff and things like this. And so what we instrument are really just the calls and the hidden state we're trying to learn is what are the enabled things, what is the allowed things. But maybe you have better ideas of how to do the instrumentation where you wouldn't have to guess. And I would love to talk to you about that. Yeah. Yeah. What about concurrency part? So have you looked a little bit if you if you might you can use those might those API rules to get new techniques to look at to discover concurrency bugs or is it useful? Do you think it's useful? Yeah, uh, good question. So I think there's two, uh, two aspects here about concurrency, right? One which is, well, so Hopper is really, we applied it to the notion of event-driven systems and, 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 and that issue, but you can also say, oh, I have different ordering constraints for the shared memory concurrent program that I can utilize and I can use that for jumping as well and see how, how well that works. We haven't tried that, but I, I, you know, we talked about it as something interesting to do. Okay. The second thing is, well, you know, we are looking at some notion of concurrency bugs, event-driven concurrency uh, bugs. These, uh, these, um, the 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 bug that I showed in the, the in the second half. Well, it's really like a high-level race, right? It's there's no data race there, mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, but it's some sort of you know race with you know particular events and be based upon some sort of state specification, right? So something like type state, but involving callbacks and call-ins, which is why we call it life state. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, great question. So the question is, um, what kind of traces are we learning from? Are we learning, for, uh, uh, learning from good traces or bad traces? Actually, it doesn't matter. Actually, all traces are fine for this particular mining problem um, because what we're trying to learn is something about the framework. So whether the app is buggy or not, what we're trying to do is learn you know, what are the relations like, oh, this method called disable uh, disables this particular callback. Right. So, uh, all we need is just interactions with the framework. But I think, you know, it of course is interesting to think about, well, can we observe something about good or bad traces and learn something else? Of course, those are interesting problems that we're looking at or are interested in. Mr. Question, do you assume that the most of the problems are the correct code <coughs> the uh, when you mine the uh, over rules? Uh, sorry, I didn't hear the first part. Do you assume that uh, the programs that from which you mine the, the rules are correct with respect to the API? So I, I think that uh, just, so what, what are the assumptions here? Well, for getting you know, the model of the framework, these, these rules that we mine, we don't have to make any assumption about whether the app is correct or not, right? We can, uh, it's just about observing how it interacts with the framework. It's, it's not about whether it's correct or not. But I think like it doesn't matter whether the app is correct or not. It's really we're trying to learn what is the behavior of the framework. Uh, how many traces did you need, or how did you create them? Ah, good question. There's never enough traces, right? And actually, a hard part is you just, you know, we're uh, as building apps. You know, we have a corpus of something like uh, sixteen thousand Android apps. So anyway, in the tens of thousands of Android apps, but the hard part is to build them. That's the, that's the hardest part, is to be able to build them in some sort of automatic way. Um, uh, let's see. So I think we are we have on the order of hundreds or maybe up to thousands of traces. Um, so it's never enough. But And then, oh, wait, how do we actually generate the traces? Uh, just using the Android Monkey tool and some manual traces. As well. How long are the traces? Huh? How long are they, the traces? Um, 
but they vary actually quite significantly. So, like, do they really explore lots of the framework? Probably not. I imagine it's a very small fraction. And you know, if we could get better data, presumably we could also get better results. What is the Android Monkey tool? Uh, Android Monkey is a tool that just ships with uh, Android uh, developer tools, which uh, just if we uh, simulates a monkey, just presses random places in the app. So you wouldn't expect it to really drive deeply in the app. I have a question on the, on the So there's lots of work on Android working on like writing the happens before model for Android. There's been a lot of work on like trying to trying to write the happens before model for Android carefully and summarize it. So if I give you the happens before model for Android, uh, I mean a lot of these automatic ordering constraints they will essentially be induced by that happens before model. Correct. So if I give you that model, you should be able to somehow, I mean, you have a low level model, and then you should be able to somehow use it to much, much more quickly learn what the API ordering, uh, what API ordering automata are. Because the model is known mostly. The model, but it's sort of fixed, right? It's a fixed order, what are the things that can happen? Yeah, it's a fixed model. But of course, it's data dependent. If this happens, if that happens, and so on. But that's a known model. I think more or less it's known. So this automata is just not clear to me. Is it a description of that model at a higher level, or is it like additional constraints that are learned, or like would that model uniquely determine the things that you're learning? That's the question. I think that's the question. I think that's the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, so uh, that is worth discussing. Uh -huh. I want to then discuss that further with you. And also in terms of the mining, the, like you mentioned, probabilistic. I mean, a lot of people work on dynamic mining. Right. Like, what is here the what is the inside different than this normal automata mining? Is this multi-state, multi-object mining, single-object? Multi. Mining? It's multi-object. Multi-object. Um, uh, yeah, multi-object. Uh, the the automata part is like we claim no, you know, newness on using automata mining. That's you know, that's for following other people. Right, but then somehow mapping that to something more abstract, a more restricted language of these life state rules. And then we try this other technique of directly. Um, so I mean, you know, I guess I can show there's some graph where basically it shows that no one approach sort of works the best for all. Um, so I run here this work, right? And then right. it's on like the mining probably uh, Right, so we can take whatever you know approach you want as far as the, the machine learning and use it, right? And then we want to then of course for every model you have to somehow abstract it to the, the rules that we care about. Um, and I just said that we, we took like these are just off the shelf tools. This is actually just using from machine learning libraries, those are not our implementation, and that is using a model counting approach, right? And I don't have anything much to say about this other than like this is saying do the rules that we learn actually abstract the, the, the traces? So using you know some sort of capable cross validation. And there's no one approach that really dominates. Um, and so you know I think our next step here is to look at you know approaches that could sort of leverage each of them, like you know, um, just starting to read and learn about like boosting and things. Say about it. Yeah. One question? No. Let's thank Kevin again. Okay.